from my father-in-law, George, and one from my dad of their time in the United States Army. Uh, both of these men served in between the Korean War and before Vietnam, so during relative peacetime. George had played football at Iowa State for a little while, and then he was drafted. The Army sent him to Okinawa. And he very quickly learned that by playing football for his battalion team, it meant extra chow in the dining hall, including chocolate milk and ice cream. So he played football in the Army. My dad served, uh, he was drafted in 1960 when he received a letter from President Eisenhower inviting him to uh, join up. So dad did, and he was sent to West Berlin when the Berlin Wall went up. My dad's greatest story, uh, the only time he ever saw a shot fired, was one afternoon when they were out in West Germany on maneuvers in the field, and a wild boar ran through the camp. <laughs> Somebody shot that hog, and very soon the first sergeant came around. We have reports of a weapon being fired in this area. And strangely enough, no one knew anything about it. That hog was already on the grill. <laughs> My dad is an Indiana farm boy, and many of his friends in the military were as well. So the good old boys had that hog butchered and fried up very quickly. That's one of my favorite stories. And my dad tells it in such a way that I think he was probably either the guy pulling the trigger or the guy on the barbecue. <laughs> Joshua knows that story, and he goes to school and starts telling it. One of his buddies says, my grandpa tells that same story. He was in the army in West Berlin in the early 60s. So we want to get his friend Sal's grandpa and my dad together to get reunited, because we're sure that they served together. So thank you to the men and women of our military. Now, there are many things in the Bible that I don't fully understand. And I imagine that there are a few things you don't understand either. Some of us have been studying the Bible for many years, and some of us are just getting started. There will be times when we try to wrestle with the hard passage, and we should do that. We live in a time when the Bible and its teachings are more accessible than ever before. If you own a Bible and I'm pretty sure that most of us have at least one, and probably more than one, you have more than most Christians who have ever lived. And in some parts of the world today, Bibles are rare because they are dangerous to own. So we are very fortunate here in the United States. Sometimes as we're reading scripture, we come across passages that are hard to understand. Last year, the adult Sunday school, for example, studied the book of Revelation, and that is always challenging. Today is not one of those days. Today we're going to look at a very simple passage of Scripture. It's easy to understand, so let's take a look at Psalm chapter 1. And Vicki's going to read that for us. Psalm 1. You find this on page 611. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruits in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like the shaft that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. This then is the reading. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word which you've inspired and preserved for us. I pray that you would help us to understand what we have heard and read. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 1 is a little different from the other psalms. It's not really a song or a hymn of praise. It's more of a poem. It's considered a wisdom psalm, part of the Bible's wisdom literature, because it spells out or describes righteous living. 
It's similar to the Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, but it is a great introduction to the rest of the Psalms. The Psalms open with this short chapter that contrasts two different ways of life. The psalmist calls them the blessed life and the way of the wicked. I love that term wicked. It has fallen out of use unless you are in New England. In New England, something that is cool is described as wicked. Oh, that was wicked awesome. Kind of like here in Chicago, that if something is bad, it's not good. Or if something is bad, that means it's really good. Okay, in New England, wicked means something different than what the psalm says here. The author, who is not named for us, describes the blessing of obedience and the consequences of sin. He says that we are blessed when we don't walk in the ways of sinners, meaning we don't do the same things that they do. <coughs> Instead of a seat with the mockers, the righteous, the righteous delight themselves in the law of the Lord. The law here represents the Bible, and in particular, the teachings of Moses. We have seen this before in Scripture. God's desire for us and one of the ways that he blesses us is through the study of his word. In the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord gave the people of Israel a job description for their king. And I'd like to read just part of it for you. Deuteronomy 17, beginning of verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, talking about the king of Israel, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God, and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, and turn from the law to the right or to the left, that he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Unfortunately, most of the kings of Israel and Judah did not follow that advice. But I hope you caught this. The king was supposed to take a copy of Moses' teaching from the priests and copy it by hand and keep that with him. I studied Hebrew for a year in seminary, and I can tell you it is not an easy language to write. Completely different alphabet from English, different grammar, different syntax. It's very difficult. If I had to copy the Old Testament in Hebrew by hand, I would be working on that from today until Jesus comes. The point is that in order to be blessed and to keep from sinning, the Lord wants us to study His Word. When we get away from that, we get into trouble. I can look back at my own life and see that when I have neglected to read the Bible, I have often found myself in times of trouble. Psalm 1 says that when we study the Word, we are like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. I think most of us know this, but a tree needs water in order to grow. In the western half of the United States, there are large sections of territory where trees are few and far between. One couple that I know recently moved out of Kansas. And one of the things they were grateful to get out of Kansas, no offense to those of you from Kansas, there aren't that many trees there. It's the plains. The only place that you see trees are along rivers and streams. This is why in nearly every major city in the United States, and I assume this is true for the rest of the world, those major cities are built on or near large bodies of water. In Israel, the same is true. Trees are found near sources of water so that they can extend their roots and put them down deep. A tree with strong roots will grow very tall and is not easily moved. They grow and they will bear fruit for many years. That's how the Lord blesses us as well. On the other hand, the wicked are said to be like chaff, which is gone with the wind. Not chafing. Chafing is bad too, but that's something else. Chaff is a little bit different. Psalm 1 describes chaff, which is part of the wheat stalk, or the wheat plant. In ancient times, the kernel of wheat was separated from the husk by hand. Today, farmers have massive combines that are just huge machines that cost more than your house. Um, my dad's friend, Smitty, that's when he goes by Smitty, uh, bought a new combine to uh, harvest corn with and paid a little over $300,000 for it. So a farmer can spend a fortune on a piece of equipment that he only uses a few times a year. That separates the fruit from the rest of the plant. But in the ancient world, the farmer would take a winnowing fork, which is similar to a pitchfork, 
and toss his crops up in the air. The heavier wheat kernel would fall to the threshing floor and the chaff would be blown in the wind. Chaff is worthless, it's very light, and it has no value, as opposed to the kernel, which is the fruit of the wheat plant, which has value and heft. Psalm 1 goes on to describe the separation of the righteous and sinners as the eventual outcome of their lives. This psalm then is prophetic because it points us to the day when Christ will return, when the wheat is separated from the chaff. Part of his return includes sitting in judgment of all humanity to separate the righteous and the wicked. That's a day that is promised in Scripture. It's one that we celebrate here at the Church of the Highlands often. The second coming of Christ is an important part of our church's doctrine. And Psalm 1 makes it personal. I believe in what we call the sovereignty of God. The phrase that we use to describe the truth that He is Lord of all. In other words, God is in control. And part of His reign includes the ability to give, to forgive sins and to grant eternal life to those whom He chooses. At the same time, it's also very clear from Scripture that we have some choices in life. So God is in control and we also have choices to make. In Psalm 1, two ways of life are contrasted. One that leads to destruction and one that leads to blessing and eternal life. So our response is pretty simple. Follow Christ by asking Him to forgive our sins, and then we follow Him in our daily lives by reading His Word, studying, praying together, and worshiping with other Christians who've made that same decision. I am pretty confident that most of us here today have already taken that step. At some point in our lives, we realized, after hearing the Gospel, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And we decided to take Jesus' offer of forgiveness. We were baptized, and now we are following Him daily. That's good, but let's consider the lesson of Psalm 1. In order to be grounded in our, in our faith, we need to be rooted in the Word. In order to be grounded in our faith, we have to be rooted in the Word. Many people come to faith in Christ, but their roots are shallow, more like a palm tree than an oak. When we lived in California, I learned that palm trees can get pretty big. We had a few on the property at the First Avenue Christian Church of Tustin, but because the sandy soil of Orange County uh, was everywhere, their roots didn't have to go very deep. A palm tree can reach massive heights, but have very shallow roots. With a little bit of rain, which is very rare in that part of the world, and then some wind, palm trees can fall very easily. They're beautiful, but they're not very strong. Here in Illinois, we have oak trees, and they can get huge. You've seen some. An oak tree can get massive, but only if they are well-grounded and have strong roots. Some Christians are like that, but too many of us are more like saplings when we should be tall oaks. We haven't grown because our roots are not strong. So to continue Psalm 1's imagery, I want to ask you, are you wheat or chaff? The reporter Barbara Walters once famously asked Catherine Hepburn, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? And folks, I'm going to ask you that same question. What kind of tree are you? Are you like a palm tree, which is beautiful and looks good, with shallow roots and is easily toppled? Or are you more like an oak? Strong and steadfast. If you're an oak, are you a sapling or are you a mature tree? Are you growing but not quite mature enough to bear fruit? I got the bright idea years ago to plant some pecan trees on Twin Bluff Farms in Missouri, Kathy's parents' place. My father-in-law, George, took care of that for me. I ordered the plants. He planted them. I was very excited to know that I had four pecan trees in the ground. And I went to bed that night dreaming of pecan sandies, <laughs> pecan pie, pecan clusters. Man, this is going to be great. Time passed. No pecans. The trees look good, but they're starting to grow. I found out it takes between 10 and 15 years for a pecan tree to bear fruit. <laughs> I will have to get back to you on that. <laughs> Hopefully, by the pile of cake auction of 2027, I will have... <laughs> I, I go out on the farm and I look at my little trees, which are a little higher now. And, okay, guys, one of these days. One of these days. 
And that says a lot about my father-in-law, because he knew that. He knew it would be 15 <laughs> years before we had trees, and he, before we had pecans, and he planted them for me anyway. That is a great statement of faith, to plant trees knowing that you will never enjoy the fruit. We get to decide what kind of tree we will be. We get to decide if we will be weak or chaff. If we want to grow and become spiritually mature, if we want to become a mighty oak in the faith. I hope that you will choose wisely. I hope that you will put roots down, get grounded in the faith, near a stream of living water. And I hope that you will join me in praying to ask the Lord to ground us in His Word and give our faith strong roots. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons of Psalm 1. And we want to thank you for the mighty oaks of the faith that we have known, like my father-in-law George, like Sister Betty, and others that we can think of, some of whom are now safe in your keeping and not here with us anymore. And we thank you for their example. And Lord, we want to be wheat and not chaff. We don't want to be saplings. We want to be mature trees that bear fruit for you. We want to become tall oaks. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be grounded by studying your word. Help us to establish roots connected to the living water so that we can grow, mature, and bear fruit for you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I need...